to talk about building uh, NLP models. And again, um, we're going we're gonna to go through like collecting data. Um, we're actually going to cover a lot more of like how we clean the data and like how we groom it is like what the you know the term is, and then build the model, and then we're going to use it in a cool and interesting way. So again, my name's David. If you attended the last session, um, I do, I've been in like the AI ML space for about three years. I've done a bunch of other things prior to this in different areas. But yeah, I kind of like really like machine learning. I kind of got into it on my own for fun. And yeah, now I work for a company that kind of does that. So we're going to start off with like, and just kind of like the last presentation, um, I'm going to kind of like level set and assume that you maybe heard of ML and you don't really know much about it. And so it's going to be kind of a Kickstarter to like even go starting from basics and then building the first machine learning model, which I'm, it's a calling it hello world, but it's really a question or sentence detector. And then we're going to move into something far more complex. So that's uh, named entity recognition. We're going to talk about how we find the data, how we groom and format the data, and how we do the processing of the data and then build the final model. And then I'm going to do another live demo. Hopefully it'll work. And yeah, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So our first NLP, so natural language processing model. Just going to cover some terms. I'm, we're only going to cover the first three up there at the top. So you probably have heard, you know, when you're building machine, learn, machine learning models, you need data. Like we typically call them data sets, but they're very, just think of it as a huge, large collection of data, specifically around the domain that you're, you're looking to you know, build a model for. In this particular example, right, because we're building natural language uh, models, there it's right words, sentences, phrases, paragraphs, speech, right? And the idea is you build a classifier, that's one type of model that you can build to search for patterns amongst your data, right? So now that you kind of have like what you're going to do, like the, the problem area or domain that you're going to do is like language. Now you need to, any machine learning model, you probably have heard the term that like machine learning models are just next, next token prediction engines. And that's like really actually very true. Um, so when you have words or sentences, you need to have a tokenizer to break them down into much smaller components, things that are represent the smallest uh, representation that your machine learning model needs to be aware about. And in natural language programming, that's actually just words, right? Um, you can actually even break them down even further than that into syllables or parts of words. But for this, we're only going to focus at the word level. So one tokenizer that we're going to use in our example is going to be uh, BERT, uh, BERT uncased, so you know, uh, capital versus lowercase, it's just uncased. Um, it's a tokenizer that's uh, from Google, so we're just going to use an off-the-shelf tokenizer. Um, there's another one called DeBerta, which is a, uh, an enhancement on BERT, and that one's coming out of Microsoft. And once you have data and you have a tokenizer to break down language into small tokens or words, in our case, you just need an, an ML framework, right? Um, you, we're going to use PyTorch. There's other ones out there like TensorFlow. There are frameworks that are built on top of both. So PyTorch and TensorFlow, Fast AI kind of is like this layer above it. It's a really cool project. If you're interested, it's open source. It's good for people who don't know anything about AI or ML who want to train models. Um, it's kind of like a great lower the barrier to entry to learn about machine learning. And then there's some other terms in there. Don't worry about it. It's, but I've thrown some, some there. So if you're going to build your first NLP model, uh, I think one of the easiest ones is to understand is a classifier. So does this thing belong to this class of things, right? And in this case, we're going to build, and I'm going to talk about how to build a, a classifier for detecting questions in, like, as a sentence, right? So is this sentence a question? It'll return true if it is, and return false if it's not. And it turns out f finding this data is actually pretty easy. There's lots of data out there um, because we all use speech, and there's tons of articles and stuff that you can like farm to, to do this. Um, but there's other, one, other data sets that are out there that are already formatted, pre-formatted for exactly what you want. And one of them is called the Stanford Question and Answer Data Set, or SQUAD for short. It is literally two columns. One column is a question, and then the other column is literally the answer to that question. And so when we're building the classifier, right, we have an entire section of data for just questions, and we have an entire section of just 
normal sentences, right? And so that's what we're going to use to build this question classifier model. So it turns out that, right, that it's actually pretty com more complex than you might think, right? Like the obvious answer would be like, why don't you just look at the end of the sentence for a question mark? That's a question, right? But it turns out that it's actually a lot more complicated than that. So I have some examples here. Um, I'm going to look at the last two. So the, the second to the last is, how are you doing, my friend, without the question mark? And you know, when I type, and I'm, you know, humans are flawed, we don't type within the rules, and sometimes you don't type, you put your punctuation in. I do this all the time, right? I don't put the question mark in, but we need to be aware that these sentences exist. And then, the last one, if you take a look at it, tell me about the history of the United States. Technically, it's a question. I'm asking you to tell me about the history of the United States. Doesn't end in a question mark, doesn't even begin with who, what, when, where, why, or how, right? But technically a question. So, a lot more complex than you think. So, we're going to take a look at some code. Again, this code will be available on GitHub. You don't need to write any of this down. It'll be all at the end of my slides. But effectively, this code will download from Stanford the question and answer data set. Um, one important area, which is very interesting, is right here, line 129. I'm purposely lopping off any question marks at the end of sentences, and also any periods at the end of sentences, to fit and manipulate my data for the cases where people aren't putting question marks. And it also happened to satisfy the tell me about the United States of California, or the United States or California or whatever, right? And so basically downloading a whole bunch of wiki pages also, just to throw in some you know, interesting other sentences. And then I'm literally then taking all of the questions, right? Taking that one column of all the answers. And if it's the answers, I'm just putting a zero, right? So it's literally sentence, zero, which is not a question. And for all the questions, I'm literally taking a call, the call question column, take all of the questions, add a new column to it, one. These are my questions. And you literally train using PyTorch to train the model. And believe it or not, if you throw enough data at it, it will actually figure it out. As an example, we'll run this right here. So right here, the, take note of this one right here. So I actually, we, I already pre-built the model, and the reason why is building the model takes two hours. <laughs> we don't have that kind of time. But um, you can see right here, how are you doing, my friend? No question mark, but is recognized as a question. So I'm passing these sentences into the model, and it's telling us whether it's a question or not. And then the last sentence, tell me about the history of the United States. No punctuation, not even a who, what, when, where, why, or how, but is a question, which is exactly what we're looking for. So that's a pretty, uh, the show of hands, that's a pretty simple example, right? Question, have a one column with all ones, answer, have a, a column with all zeros, then just train the model, and then you can literally run the code. So that's pretty simple. Here's a recap. I'm just going to skip it. This is for your notes later on if you're interested in learning more about this. So let's build a much more complicated model. So we're going to build a named entity recognition model. And for, you probably are familiar with named entity. They're, uh, and the, the idea of named entity recognition is literally extracting and classifying things in unstructured text, so things that you normally find in a sentence, into predefined categories that you're interested in labeling. So some very normal, like examples that we're all familiar with for named entity recognition is uh, personal identifiable information, right? Your social security number, that's personal identifiable information, that's a named entity. Your name, believe it or not, your IP address, right? Because I can identify who you are based on your IP address. Then there's protected health information, right? Like maybe your blood type, the, the medications that you're taking, the type of injuries, anything that in a medical sense to identify who you are based on your blood type, your, the you know, drugs, medications you may be taking, or injuries, right? From that, you can probably maybe potentially figure out who a person is based off of you know, that, this information. So more basically, named entities is just labels, right, that you're applying to words. And so I just want you to think about that. It's not 
personal identifiable information. It's not this, it's not that. It's literally you're trying to classify words into mapped to a particular label. And that's literally all it is. So the difficult part is where to get the data. That's literally I, like all machine learning. It's like literally you'll spend the majority of your academic professional, if you're training models, where the heck do I get all this data? If you have the data, great. Like that's, you know, a huge relief if you have it. If you don't, where do you get it? So here's some just suggestions if you're building a named entity recognition model of where you can go. So there's this actually this really cool repo. Someone else curated this list and this is actually the list of uh, data sets that I used to build this model, which I'm, you know, it's all this code is going to be open, including this data, by the way, because the data I selected is uh, not marked. It's redistributable, so I, I have no problem, no legal problems redistributing this. But here's a good example of someone's just GitHub repo where they've collected different data sets for different things. So like there's medical related, someone's Twitter data sets, social media, medical data sets. So you can find it, it's out there. Uh, another place you can go is Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is like the largest open source, well, open, uh, you know, ML AI community out there. People post their data sets, people post their models. Um, you can go to Kaggle. Someone else had mentioned this in the previous presentation. You can uh, download data sets there. It's a lot of people who are you know, like academics and stuff who are like trying to prove out their models. That's where they post their stuff to like, you know, get buy, both buy-in and also secondary verification. Or you can go to academic torrents. In our case, for named entity recognition, there, this is actually a pretty established problem. And someone, uh, a group of people, actually at a conference, uh, came out with uh, a particular format for how you would use named entity recognition. And it's the C-O-N-L-L, -L, which stands for the Conference of Computational Lang Natural Language and Learning. It's a conference that they, I guess, apparently have every year. But it's uh, where they talk about like how do they classify and how do they talk about natural language? How do they do the labeling and like the, the tagging for all this kind of stuff? So you can literally just go Google search C-O-N-N-L format, get a whole bunch of data that's already pre-formatted into like what you're looking for. Having said that, most of that data is going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it is. You know, the, the availability of the format's great. People are posting their data sets. A lot of this stuff is widely available, but a lot of the times this stuff isn't labeled correctly. And uh, I'll kind of cover that in a second, but the after you obtain the data, um, hopefully you don't have to like, you know, find and curate the data and collect all of it. Hopefully you can just download it. But when you go and you groom and you format your data, a lot of the times the, the labeling is all completely off. And so you spend, I would say like 75, 80% of your time literally fixing the data, fixing the labeling. My advice would be, and I actually have some code for it, um, you can just build applications, like little things to like run through your data to verify it and, and, or change certain things or, you know, reformat or relabel certain things that you, you know are not correct or you know that are not right and you need to correct them. And just know that also when you're grooming and formatting your data that these labels apply to multiple words. So when you have a named entity, the named entity isn't just one word, it could be a collection of words, right? So for example, like David, me, right? That's my name, is a person's name. The United States of America, right, that is a location, but it's not just United, it's not just States of America, right? The entire collection of words is one location. When you're building your, your named entity recognition models or your whatever generic labeling model, you need to be aware that sometimes your entities might span multiple words, right? This is what that C-O-N-N-L format looks like, and this is a good representation of it. So here we can take a look. It comes in four columns. It's usually space delimited. You have the word, which is, you know, the token that we're interested in, United Nations official, I'm gonna totally butcher that guy's name or person's name, heads uh, for Baghdad. Um, then you have the part of speech, 
the syntactic chunk, and then really what we care about is this entity tag. And to denote the beginning of an entity and like the continuation of the entity, they literally use B hyphen organization is the beginning of United Nations. And then for nations, it's literally I hyphen organization, which is the continuation of this entity. So you can see like Baghdad is B for beginning of a location. Labeling, putting metadata or tags, two words. Now often when I said you look at the data sets you download, oftentimes you'll find this and you'll have to go and fix this. And the reason why you have to fix this might not be obvious. So if you see that O tag, that O tag means that this is nothing, like ignore it. It's not an entity that you care about or you recognize or want to recognize. But in saying that, if I have United Nations with an O tag, that means I don't want to recognize it. And that will throw off your machine learning model when you're trying to have it detect all of these entities. And that's the biggest reason why when you are doing your data and you're, you're grooming it, you need to correct these things. Otherwise, this will throw off the training for your model. And so that's the reason why you're going to spend the majority of your time like correcting the data that you've downloaded. Download your data, clean it, format it, make sure that the labeling is correct. Now we need to take that data and we need to map it to something that the a PyTorch can consume very easily. And kind of the easiest way is, so I feel like the United Nations is, right? We can see right here. The easiest way, and it, it's kind of like an extension of that question and answer, right? Question, if it's a question, you have ones. And if it's an answer, you have zeros. If it's a, the beginning of an organization, you have one. If it's a continuation, you have one. Everything else is zero. So you literally have a fully complete extended for every entity that you're interested in, or whatever label or whatever entity you're trying to discover, you have the B, which is the beginning of the entity, the I or the continuation. You literally have all of them strung out. You have a column for every single type that you care about. And you literally have one or zero next to it. So that's literally how you structure your data for ingest into, into PyTorch. It's one of the ways. It's the easiest way. Uh, do questions at the end. Yeah, yeah, OK. And we need a tokenizer, right? We need a tokenizer to, to basically write, break down sentences and paragraphs and stuff into single words. And so for that, like I said, we're going to use BERT. Um, uncased, because we don't want to have uppercase United Nation and lowercase that we have to worry about. And But we're basically going to have uh, tokens or words followed by all of the different labels. And then there's this little attenuation mask. We don't have to worry about it. But there's basically we need to pad things for when things are not exactly aligned properly. Download the data, clean it, and then set it up for formatting to ingest. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. This one's. I'm only going to look at one. This is the model that I trained um, to do named entity recognition. So for the first one, Dr. Alice Smith from Stanford University will attend the conference on July 20th. So Dr. Attribute, Alice Smith, the beginning of the name, and then Smith, the end of the name. Stanford, beginning of the organization, university, continuation of the organization. Um, July is the date and the time is the 20th, right? So this is like a working example of a model, yeah, that does named entity recognition. So let's do something interesting with both these two models, this question model and this named entity recognition model. And I thought it'd be kind of cool. I, you know, you probably saw, if you saw the last demo where the voice AI agent, um, I thought I would do something interesting. And why I think this is interesting is, is because if you were to create a bot to connect to like a WebRTC application, you could use the speech to text transcription to like listen in on a conversation. And so I kind of modeled it after that. And the, what the demo is, I'm going to talk into my computer here using my microphone. It's going to convert the stuff to text. If it is not a question, it's going to query ChatGPT, and if it detects a name entity, it's ChatGPT is going to give me two pieces of information about that named entity. And if it is a question, ChatGPT is going to, using 
text to speech. It's going to reply back to me over my speakers and answer the question for me, plus also give me those two little tidbits of information for every named entity that it detects. And we're doing this by putting a REST API interface over the question model, and we're putting a REST API uh, interface over the named entity recognition model. And that's kind of like how it works. So let's give this a try. Start the service. See? Okay, start the service for the uh, named entity recognition. Start the service for the question model. Okay. Okay. Try one more time. <laughs> I live in Long Beach, California. Where is Microsoft headquartered at? Microsoft is headquartered in Redmond, Washington, United States. The address is 1 Microsoft Way, Redmond, WA98052. I'm going to stop it right there. Didn't detect that the first statement was a question. It was just a statement. It found two entities, Long Beach and California. It's actually where I live. It queried ChatGPT to get more information about Long Beach and California. And then I asked, where is Microsoft headquartered at? And then you got the reply back from ChatGPT. Um, it detected that Microsoft is an organization well, founded by Bill Gates and Paul Allen in 1975. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting why it came up with location. Okay. Um, the United States, another location, and then the, the address for where Microsoft is headquartered at. Very important to clean your data. This is actually, I provided a ton of data in training the named entity recognition model. You need a ton more data. Um, this is only a great start. There's one uh, data set that I cannot redistribute and is actually very difficult to get. I did not use it in the training of this, but it probably would have greatly benefited from it. It's called like O, o Notes, OT Notes 5. I did find it on academic torrents but I didn't end up using it, but it was a massive data set to help with named entity recognition. So here's kind of a recap of like everything we discussed in this section, presentation resources, materials. So this literally, you can actually, the first link here, part one, first the slides, then obviously the slides, which you're looking at contains the, you know, how to build the model. And this is literally code to build the model for the question classification. This one actually uses fast AI. I did that intentionally because I think it's maybe a good starter for people who aren't particularly uh, knowledgeable about ML, like a good way to get started with it. Named entity recognition model, you can see the code here to train it. It also has all of the data associated with it. So if you click here, this named entity recognition.final is a zip file that literally contains all the text files, which in that C-O-N-L-L format to train the model. And then the final demo I use in the presentation, plus some other resources here. Um, and yeah, that's my presentation. Any questions? Yeah, so uh, I was actually thinking when you were showing the uh, uh, entity-based uh, 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 classification. So what have, yeah, uh, so what if let's say nations is also a beginning? It could be a beginning as well as a uh, continuation. Right. So. Uh, yeah, and like, how do you then uh, classify those things? Yeah, so you're so let me hopefully um, digest the question here. So you're saying what happens if a named entity is in two different categories, right? Yeah. So actually, the model that I created, along with the formatting, the model that I created actually allows you to do multiple t labels for one word, and the way it does is, is that, like I kind of went off script to do uh, the CONNL format usually only allows one label. So I went off script to do this and I did a pipe between, so in the entity column, you'll actually see for things that are like both a name organization and maybe even a location, it'll be name, pipe, organization, pipe, this. And actually the code will actually do allow you to do multi-label labeling and named entity recognition. So you can have one word or a group of words come up as any number of entities. Uh, again, amazing presentation like that. But uh, my question is, um, so when we were classifying uh, uh, and like processing and building stuff, uh, 
so to understand question and statements, um, we, we did a lot of coding for sure. But uh, instead of doing all that, if I use NLTK library, and then I just use the sentence tokenizer, and then I uh, pair it with sentiment, uh, the same analysis. I'll get to know that this is the statement. Like I'm firstly making it like uh, normalizing it, making everything lower. Mm -hmm. Then I'm removing all the stop words. And then I'm just taking the essence of that statement with the sentiment analysis, and it right. will give it like it's like a couple of codes, and we will know if it is a question or an. And, and it will definitely let us know that it's tell will also consider it as a question. How is without punctuation will also be considered as sentiments. So um, all these uh, items that we did mm -hmm. uh, and the new library that we used, can we use like the traditional libraries that we have to get the same impact? Yeah, so maybe to rephrase it again. Um, so you want to be able to detect other things besides just question and answer. Maybe you want to understand like the sentiment of the question or the, the statement or, or whatever and have both of those things be surfaced if you want, if you're interested in querying I mean, like, for it. We, we can just, uh, we need, need to know, is it a question or a statement, right? Right. So if the sentiment, sentiment says it's a question, that means it's a question. And if it is not uh, a question, it's a statement. Yeah. So if we use just the two libraries and, and uh, pull it off. Right. So it now, the, so the reason why I went through the extra, so a question and answer model, I'm sure you can probably Google, and I'm, I know for a fact that uh, Hugging Face, they have several of them out there. Um, the reason why I kind of wanted to go just through the exercise of building it is just to kind of like start with something simple that where you're actually building it on your own. Um, the other advantage too is that you can tailor it to, uh, uh, you know, whatever you're interested in, right? So you can literally, like as an example, like if you lop off the question marks or all the periods at the end of, um, in the code, it's actually the end of 15% of all of the statements and questions. You can start to manipulate the data. So when I took the initial data set, the Stanford data set, and I just ran it through, um, you know, I ran it through, built the model, and then I got to the last one. It said, tell me about the United States. It actually came back as a non-question. And then that's when I realized that I started to have to manipulate the data such that it recognized that that was a question. And so kind of the reason why I'm like going through the exercise of doing this is to also show you that um, be careful with synthetic data, but with synthetic data, you can manipulate it such that it fits what you're trying to do, right? And that, that's kind of the, just the reason why. Uh, two last small questions. One, when we are getting a response from ChatGPT, it's going to give us a lot of detail. Like, tell me m about United Nations. It will give you at least, you know, unless you say pro provide details about uh, United Nations in hundred words, right. only then and put it in three bullet points. So, is this the same prompt that we are using in back? End? This is the same. So, okay. it's basically, the prompt, and you'll actually see it in the code too. It mm -hmm. says because we don't want it to chat forever. I said, pick two. Uh, pick two facts, mm -hmm. limit your response to 100 words at most, like cap it there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, yeah, and then tell me about, enter the word in there, and go query chat GPT, and then that was literally the response in like the bulleted form, yeah. Perfect, thank you so much. And the last one, I see that we are using OpenAI, importing Open, so it will require an API key. So yes. the ones that are there, will it be applicable, like valid for, Forever or like? No, no, no. But it usually expires after a couple of days. No, no, it's not even here. Uh, so if we actually go to the code. I actually literally also, by the way, so the named entity recognition when we're looking on the screen right there, I have a readme that like says what you need to do to actually run this thing. I mean, I did this for all the examples, but one of the prerequisites is, where is it? Um, oh, it wasn't this one. Sorry. It was the demo. So to do the speech to text and the text to speech, you need a DeepGram account. That's the company that I work for. Um, I just use it as a means to like drive the demo. You need an OpenAI account. So you need an OpenAI account to get an API key. I'm not providing it. They're both free anyways. Um, with DeepGram, you get 200 credits, which 
I'm still using it for over a year now <laughs> with my 200 credits. I don't even have like a, a company provided one. I'm still using the $200 free account one that I created like over a year ago. And then, um, yeah, you need an open AI key, which is free. I mean, depending on the models you're going to use, it's going to cost you something. But if you stick to like, what is it? Um, the O4 mini, it's basically effectively a penny or two tops over, you know, time. Thank you so yep. much. Sir.